Good afternoon, Randy, and thank you very much for giving some time to us uh, to, to talk to the Mint. Um, I'd like to just start with really a very basic question, uh, which is, can you explain very simply what modern monetary theory is? Because I know a lot of people get quite confused and find it quite difficult to take in. Yes, modern money theory attempts to explain how a modern sovereign currency works. And um, we uh, apply this uh, to a nation that issues its own currency that doesn't promise to convert it to precious metal or foreign currencies, uh, that imposes obligations uh, nowadays, that's largely taxes, but in the past, it could be fees, fines, tributes, tithes, and so on. In its own currency, issues its own currency, and accepts payments in its own currency. And that's, that's most countries, isn't it? Uh, do that or... Uh, well, <laughs> the major countries, yes. Okay. There, are, there are many small developing countries that pegged foreign currencies. And so, so they pay their staff in foreign country. No, they, they probably pay in their own currency, but they peg their currency on a fixed exchange rate. Say, sometimes you use the term dollarization or euroization. Um, so uh, all of the principles don't necessarily apply to them. Their policy space is much more constrained than for countries that issue their own currencies and do not peg to something else. Okay. So that's the, so, and, and what does the theory basically say then for the sort of countries that have a sovereign uh, money? Well, so there are several conclusions that come uh, from that. One is they can never run out of their own currency. They can always make payments in their own currency as they come due. They can never be forced uh, into bankruptcy or insolvency. Uh, so those are the, the main uh, conclusions that would apply to a country that fits this definition of sovereign currency. Okay, and does it make any difference <clears throat> if they have, say, debt denominated in dollars when their own currency is something else? Is British pounds. It, yeah. Yes, it could make a big difference. So issuing debt in a foreign currency uh, has constraints that are somewhat similar to uh, pegging your currency to the foreign currency because you have to deliver that foreign currency. So that's the key. If you only promise to deliver your own currency in payments, you can always meet that obligation. If you promise to deliver in a foreign currency, you might be able to meet it, but you might not be able to meet it. It depends on your ability to get the foreign currency. So, and is it true that most countries would have debt? Or quite a lot of debt denominated in dollars because that's the sort of international currency. Well, in sheer numbers, I'm sure there are a lot of countries that do that. Uh, the big countries do not do that. I, I'm talking about the, the government itself. Okay. Private firms may well denominate some of their debts in dollars, even though they're in the UK. But I'm talking about the British government itself does not commit itself to delivering dollars to pay okay. its own debts. So, I mean, obviously, we have this is recorded during the um, election campaign when both our parties, Labour and Conservatives, are promising to spend a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, when previously, obviously, we've had a number of years of austerity when they said we can't get into debt. And now it seems they're not so bothered in terms of getting into debt. And, and from an MMT perspective, they're right. They shouldn't worry too much. Is that right? Yes, that is correct. As long as they're issuing debt in uh, British pounds, the sovereign government will always be able to make those payments as they come due. And what about the main thing that people say, well, what about um, inflation? Don't they? That, so could this just drive inflation if you're basically taking out more debt and putting more currency into the system? Well, it's not the amount of currency or debt in the system. It is the relationship between the government spending and the available resources. 
if the government is hiring up resources that are currently idle or unemployed, that's not likely to be inflationary. If the government, if you're already close to full employment and the government ramps up its spending, it is the spending, the flow of spending that's going to be inflationary. Uh, I, I know that, that, that people, they don't make a distinction between what we call the money supply, the supply of currency, or the supply of debt. Those are all stock variables. Right. What I'm saying is the flow spending variables that could be inflationary. The actual purchasing of resources that could be inflationary. If all the resources have already been absorbed into the economy yeah. and the government starts competing with uh, the private sector or say with local governments and hiring the resources away from them, that's probably going to be inflationary. And, and that is, it, yes. how is this different then from Keynes in that, I mean, he... It's not. Okay, so this <laughs> is... So what, so what is the difference between Keynesian, Keynesianism and MMT then? Or is, is there not a lot? Or? Well, of course, now Keynesianism is not the same thing as Keynes. Okay. We have, we've had lots of people claiming to be Keynesians uh, all the way back from the very beginning who were not following Keynes. Uh, so, I mean, there's all kinds of varieties of Keynesians. There's ISLM Keynesians. Okay, so that's the sort of very mainstream. You have to be yes. careful. I, you know, this is getting sort of technical, but the sort of mainstream took Keynes yes. and sort of tamed him into a system that they liked. So if yes. they've been serious about listening to Keynes, what he actually said, uh, would MMT follow from that? And would Keynes say, yeah, MMT, that's fine. I'm right with it. I think absolutely so. In fact, uh, we use Keynes as how to pay for the war when we discuss ramping up government spending for something like the Green New Deal, Keynes provides the guiding light. We, we do not differ at all. It's just that our critics either uh, don't understand Keynes, haven't read Keynes, uh, don't like Keynes, or uh, they uh, just haven't read us very carefully. We've always emphasized that the true barrier is the inflation barrier the resource barrier. The barrier is not that the government will run out of money. Keynes understood this too, though. And so there's also post-Keynesianism, isn't there? And post-Keynesians tend to claim they followed Keynes better than <laughs> the yes. mainstream. So is there, is there actually much difference between post-Keynesians and MMT people? What's the, what's the, what's the difference there? Well, uh, unfortunately, there is. Okay. Now, let me tell you, MMT grew out of post-Keynesian economics. I'm a post-Keynesian. I'm one of the editors of the main post-Keynesian journal, the okay. journal of post-Keynesian economics. I am a post-Keynesian. But what happened about 25 years ago when we first started discussing this stuff, um, uh, which I think you can find in Keynes and you can find in all of the other forefathers and foremothers of heterodox economics, is that we were thrown out. It wasn't that, that we left Keynes. We were thrown out of post-Keynesian economics. And our harshest critics today are still post-Keynesians who are not following Keynes. And what is that? So why, why did they throw you out? And what was your crime? Uh, you know, we never could figure this out. I still have not figured that out. I, I think today a lot of it is jealousy, professional jealousy. But... I mean, back when we were thrown out, it, it, that wasn't really it because we were getting no attention either. Post Keynesians get no attention, <clears throat> and we were getting no attention either. Now we get tremendous amounts of it, attention, and so the uh, criticism has, um, you know, just exploded. And that's uh, and and you got a lot <clears throat> of this attention due to the publicity around the Green New Deal. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, that, that helped a lot. The global financial crisis also helped. So <clears throat> a lot of people started rethinking um, macroeconomics as a result of the global financial crisis. Uh, advocates of MMT were uh, among the very few who, who saw the crisis coming and um, who argued that monetary policy, QE, whatever the Fed did, or, and Bank of England did, was not going to be very helpful. That what we really needed was fiscal policy. 
So we got attention then. There was a spike of attention. Um, but then, yes, the Green New Deal, AOC, Bernie Sanders, uh, all of that then um, really boosted the attention. But then, I mean, and I suppose a sign of how much attention you got was that Krugman uh, and people like that started attacking you, didn't they? And the, and the, and the people like that only attack you if you're, re you know, if you're suddenly considered a threat. Right. So right after the crisis, uh, there was lots of back and forth with Krugman. Um, and then, yes, it got heated up even more uh, when uh, AOC came out, I mean, taking a picture with uh, the textbook that Bill Mitchell, Martin Watson, I wrote. And what, and, and why did AOC grab hold? And are, are they still grabbing hold of MMT or have they decided it's too hot to handle? Oh, no, no. She, she is still completely on board. Okay. Um, well, the reason why it's so important is because, um, you know, I've become convinced that uh, we've got about a dozen years left of organized human life on this planet if we don't do something. And the, the challenges we face are tremendous. And we will not be able to rise to the challenge uh, with the kind of thinking about budget constraints that are now dominant in uh, orthodoxy, the mainstream, but also among most of the heterodox economists. We will not survive without uh, understanding the fiscal uh, space that's available to countries that issue their own currency, because these are the dominant countries. I said, there, there are smaller countries around the world that don't have sovereign currencies, but they're smaller countries anyway. The big nations have their own sovereign currencies. They're the ones that have to meet this challenge. So at the moment, people are saying, we can't afford to save the world sort of thing, yeah. they? you know. We haven't, but who's going to pay for it? It is an extraordinary idea that when people thought, well, we've got to do stuff, and then they said, well, we can't afford to do it. I mean, right. yeah. and, and so you're sort of, what you bring to the table is saying, well, actually, if you really understand money, you can see that we can afford it because it's all about the resources you have, the people and so forth, to get together to do something. Um, right. if, if we have the resources, which I think that, that we do, we're going to have to free some up from current uses. And if we have the technical know-how, now that's not my field, I'm not that kind of a scientist, but the scientists seem to think that we do have the technical know-how, then of course we can do it. Affordability is not our problem. The idea that, well, it's so expensive, let's just go extinct instead is just, it's too silly to even discuss, but we hear it all the time. Well, I mean, so when, uh, I mean, Krugman, what is, does Krugman come from the fact that we can't afford it space as well, or what? Um, no, I don't, I don't think so. I think um, the, the, the more reasonable mainstream economists all do agree that the fiscal space is greater than what, was, what had previously been believed. I, I don't the think- The fiscal space is greater, meaning we can borrow more, we can do more, and we haven't got these yes. constraints, yeah. yeah. But, but then, you know, they, they put conditions on it. He will say, well, in the current interest rate environment, right, where the borrowing costs are really low, we can afford to do it. And our argument is that, uh, you know, we don't need those special conditions. Uh, we can go forward and afford this no matter what the Fed does. Let's say the Fed goes crazy, uh, the Bank of England goes crazy, they start raising interest rates when they see budget deficits. Does that mean then we have to give up? I would say, no, go ahead and spend. I mean, I would try to rein them in. I would try to put them under the treasury as we did in World War II and tell them, no, you're not gonna raise rates. Uh, but there's this, this, it's almost become a religion that central banks have to be independent of policy uh, maker, elected policy yeah. makers, which is crazy in, it, in itself. But I would say, even if we can't constrain them, affordability is, is not an issue. We don't need a low interest rate environment. Or they will say that, you know, it's okay to run the deficit up a bit, but we really need tax increases. Uh, and the, the problem with that is mostly a political problem, uh, that once you start throwing tax increases at people, you immediately are gonna lose 
a huge percentage of the population and of the elected officials. Why tie survival to a tax increase? Yes. So what, it's amazing when you think about it that you're saying we can do it, the sort of we can, which of course is, you know, the great sort of spirit of America, isn't it, in a way, the, the, the idea we can, that sort of positivity. And no one wants to, everyone wants to sort of push you down and say, we can't. Um, it's impossible. We can't survive, etc. I mean, what is, what is going on, do you think? Um, there is a lot of um, short-termism. It, it actually may be worse in America uh, than in other countries where the, um, the time horizon of, say, all of our... Um, all of the elected officials in our in the house the time horizon is two years because they go up for election every two years the senate is a bit better at six years uh, but the time horizon is very very short and it takes so much money to win an election and uh you know where money comes from it comes from uh rich folks yeah uh, and corporations that they're taking a very, very short-term uh, horizon uh, for planning. And we, what we need to do is um, map out a strategy for the next 12 years. What are we going to do? We, and, and climate change is, of course, what people are focusing on, but that's just part of the problem. We have an inequality problem. We have a housing problem. We have a poverty problem. We have a healthcare problem in the United States. You're lucky you don't have that. These are all crises. Yeah. They're all crises. All at the same time, we have a refugee crisis, and it will get much worse as uh, climate change continues. We need to deal with all of these things. So the, the challenges we face are much greater than World War II, much greater. Now, find, in terms of resources and the total amount of spending, they're not. They're not as big as World War II. World War II took 50% of U.S. GDP. It probably was higher in the U.K. I don't know the number. Yeah. So that's 50% of all GDP had to go to the war effort. The Green New Deal is going to be much less than that. It's going to be 5 10% of GDP for the next 12 years, every year for 12 years. So it, on, measured that way, it's much smaller but the consequences are bigger than World War II. Now, I wouldn't have liked for the Nazis to win, but some kind of civilization would have survived. Yeah. This time, it will not survive. So, you're trying to tell people it's possible. You've got all these people saying no, and presumably part of it is that they've told the story for decades about the fact you can't put up too much debt and so forth, so it's difficult for them to suddenly turn around and say, well, everything I said in the past you know, actually isn't true. Yeah. What is, what's your strategy then to try and overturn this sort of old style thinking then that's caught in this political um, system? Well, you know, so MMT began about 25 years ago and we've, we've tried a number of different strategies beginning with trying to convince other academics. That was a complete failure. Okay. Uh, we, we, we tried meeting with politicians and uh, the brighter ones could understand what we were saying. And they say, yes, but I can't say that in public. If I said that in public, my career would be over. Yeah, so, so is that the fundamental problem? The fact that they feel they cannot put that story out there. Everyone yes. would look at them and call them uh, uh, irresponsible. Yes. Okay. Now the strategy that has worked uh, has been the, the internet, the blogs, and I guess now tweets, I don't do that, but apparently that's a big thing now. <laughs> I believe the young tweet, you know. <laughs> uh, but but get reaching out so that now there are tens of thousands of followers of MMT and they go uh, to, the, to the public uh, talks. They go challenge the politicians. When Paul Krugman writes something silly, He's just mercilessly, merc uh, without mercy, attacked by followers of MMT. Now, this is not always a good thing because they don't always understand uh, MMT very well. Uh, they're not very polite. They upset okay. him a lot. Yeah. But 
but there are people all over the place now who at least understand the basic principles and they're not going to take no for an answer. And so the politicians are being pushed. And then you have a few courageous ones. So AOC comes out and she embraces it. She understands it and she's not going to stop. Uh, so, uh, so what I'm saying is that gives the politicians the space they need to be able to tell the truth. Are there any Democrat actual uh, Democrats who are running to stand as uh, for president? Are any of them out as MMT supporters? Um, I I don't think we could make that claim. Now I I know that uh, a number of them uh, understand it and um, uh, have have had. MMT people who are giving them advice. Okay, uh, Stephanie Kelton is one of Bernie Sanders' main uh, advisors. Yeah, and so she's had this discussion with him many times, and so people ask me, "Well, but I don't hear Bernie Sanders coming out and fully endorsing the MMT. He doesn't endorse the job guarantee, although he doesn't have a plan yet." Um, and my response is. That really doesn't matter that much, you know. We we don't need him to go out in public and, and say it. We know that he understands it. He uh, has plans for a wide uh, variety of the elements of the Green New Deal already. He's got the papers out, and he's going to push what's right, whether or not he goes out and takes a stand on whether MMT is correct or not. Yeah. So you don't, as long as you've got a compelling narrative to take action that is needed you don't have to say oh by the way technically this <laughs> is uh you believe in mnt or anything like that do you right um brilliant so so do you feel at the end of the day that more positive about sort of acceptance of where you've come from in the political sphere uh yes definitely um what what we hear from uh even the uh, the most mainstream economists who um, are listened to by policymakers, um, so Mario Draghi, he said, "People, we need to give MMT a chance." This Mario Draghi, as he leaves office, um, I, I'm giving testimony before Congress next week, and on right. that, with me is Blanchard. Blanchard is. Uh, moved toward the same conclusions that we reach um, over the past couple of years. So I think that um, it is having a big impact. Now, you know, I don't really care at all whether they recognize MMT. That's not what's important. They recognize the policy space that's available and they recognize that we face serious problems and that only fiscal policy is going to uh, help resolve those problems. That's what's important. And here, I suppose, the politicians use the cover of um, investment, don't they? They say we're investing in the future, yeah. uh, which they feel is a sort of saleable proposition, although somewhat problematic, isn't it? Because investment is sort of defined in a slightly sort of odd way. You can build a hospital, but you can't employ the people to actually run the hospital. Well, that would be a problem if, <laughs> Yeah, if you just build the um, the infrastructure you need, but you claim you can't afford the wages, that that will be a big problem. Yeah, and that because they they feel that you know that the, the political space they can only really tell that story, and and remain keep a sort of air of uh, responsibility. It, infrastructure investment is a bit sexier than saying yeah. we're going to create jobs. That is right. It's a problem. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Randy. That's been incredibly useful. And I think you really communicated the, the issues. And, it, and it's amazing when, I mean, what a, a really empowering idea it is, if, if only we could grab hold of it. Yes, I, I am uh, optimistic. Well, I mean, I could quote Churchill, <laughs> <laughs> right? The Americans, uh, try everything and, uh, until finally they do the right thing. Uh, <laughs> so I, I don't want to just make this about America. Um, I think that that uh, hopefully that will apply to all of us.
Yeah. And hopefully it's quite soon. Yeah. Thank you very much, Randy. And uh, uh, that's been really interesting to, to hear your, your views. Yeah, thanks for giving us a chance.